Good morning. Good morning. I'm Willis B. Shuftal, Interim Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs here at the college. Welcome to our annual Reflections of Excellence panel discussion. On behalf of our 10th President, Dr. Robert Michael Franklin, and the Morehouse College family, it's my distinct honor to extend greetings to our 2012 Benny and Campbell Award recipients. We will also extend greetings, we also extend greetings to our students, our parents, faculty, staff, alumni, and extended family. Since its inception in 1867, Morehouse has been responsible for cultivating the minds of young men. Our philosophy is that by combining equal parts of academic instruction and lessons in service and integrity, Morehouse will instill in her sons the desire to improve the conditions of the world and its people. Ultimately, our students leave these hallowed halls prepared to make positive contributions in our respective global communities. You may rest assured that we remain committed to developing Morehouse men, Renaissance men with a social conscience and a global perspective. But now to the reason that we are gathered here today, our Reflections of Excellence program. Tonight, the college will formally recognize five honorees at the 24th annual A Candle in the Dark Gale. However, this program, a special feature of our annual Founders Week celebration, will allow you an opportunity to hear our honorees discuss their lives and accomplishments more fully than time will permit tonight. I'm certain that you will be inspired by their stories as I have been. Our moderator this morning is a newcomer to the Atlanta news scene, Mr. DeMarco Morgan, a Tulsa native with a solid record of experience on the desk and in the field. DeMarco has worked as an anchor and reporter in a number of key television markets. Prior to joining Atlanta's NBC affiliate, WXIATV, and the 11 and that Alive News team last month, DeMarco made career stops in New York, Miami, Milwaukee, and Jackson, Mississippi. DeMarco earned his undergraduate degree from Jackson State University. He then went on to earn his master's degree from Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism. While at Columbia, he co-founded the Day School's student chapter of the National Association of Black Journalists, interned with CBS News in 48 hours, and was named a DuPont and a CBS scholar. Also, while a graduate student, DeMarco covered the September 11th terror attacks, along with a variety of other major and national stories. During the span of his career, DeMarco has interviewed a list of notable figures, from former U.S. President Bill Clinton to Africa's first elected female head of state, Liberian President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. DeMarco is a strong advocate of community service and has volunteered with Big Brothers Big Sisters, 100 Black Men of America, and the American Cancer Society. He has also served on the board of managers for the YMCA, and he is a proud member of Kappa Alpha Psi. In 2006, DeMarco was named one of America's young, young leaders of the future by Ebony Magazine, and in the same year, he also received the National Community Service Award from the National Association of Black Journalists. DeMarco's motto in life can be found in the African proverb. Care more than others think is wise, risk more than others think is safe, dream more than others think is practical, and expect more than others think is possible. Please join me in welcoming our moderator for the day, Mr. DeMarco Morgan. A wise man once said that your true character is revealed by the clarity of your convictions, the choices you make, and the promises you keep. You have to hold strongly to your principles and refuse to follow the currents of convenience, for what you say and do defines who you are, and who you are 
you are forever. Good morning. morning. We can do better than that. Good morning, everyone. Once again, I am DeMarco Morgan, and it is indeed an honor and a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you, Dr. Sheffdahl, and also President Franklin for giving me this opportunity to serve as your host. And also, greetings from 11 Alive and uh, NBC Universal as well. I am so honored to be here again uh, at the breakfast today. I had mentioned that I had a little secret that I wanted to go to Morehouse, but please don't tweet that because I can only hear my Jackson State Tigers saying, what in the world are you talking about? But uh, this is an amazing school and it has tons of respect. We're gonna be honoring a number of people this weekend. You see them on the uh, stage here. And we don't want anyone to feel left out. So I know everyone in here has been to a black church, so you know what I'm about to do. Turn to the person seated next to you and repeat after me. Say neighbor. neighbor. Come on now. Say neighbor. neighbor. You look good this morning. Now give yourselves a round of applause just for showing up. This program is your opportunity to hear firsthand from the 2012 Benny and Candle Award recipients about their experiences and challenges that have led to their individual successes. And today we will hear from change agents who have supplied voice and vision in their respective fields. But of course, before we get started, a reminder, please turn your cell phones off. And if you can't turn them off because you're making some money, Put it on vibrate. We just want to be respectful today. And also remember that the question and answer period will come at the end of the program. When that time comes, there will be microphones available in each aisle. And you will be able to form a line to ask your questions. At that time, we ask that no more than five persons stand in line at each microphone at any given time. This will allow us to make better use of the brief time that we have for these exceptional African-American leaders. Now let's meet our honorees. Our first honoree this morning is Dr. Herman Bostic, Morehouse College, class of 1949. He is a recipient of the 2012 Benny Leadership Award, and Dr. Bostic is a distinguished educator in the field of foreign languages. Throughout his stellar career, he has headed departments of foreign languages at some of the premier educational institutions in the country, including Morehouse College, Texas Southern University, and most recently, Howard University. As an enthusiastic spokesperson for language education and professionalism, Dr. Bostic conceived the idea for the Southern Conference on Language Teaching while serving as a Georgia Department of Education foreign language consultant. The Southern Conference on Language Teaching, also known as SCOT, is one of five regional affiliates of the American Council on Teaching of Foreign Languages. And SCOT endeavors to provide support and leadership to its members who in turn strive to enhance student learning. Now, SCOPE collaborates with other organizations at the state, regional, national, and international levels to promote universal world language education, and it is supported by the community, valued by political and business leaders, encouraged by parents and peers, and taught by some incredible instructors. Dr. Bostic served as the organization's first executive secretary from 1964 to 1970, and as the organization's executive director from 1970 to 1974. Dr. Bostic is also credited with founding the Foreign Language Association of Georgia, and he served as this organization's first president, an important and busy man here. His desire to encourage new foreign language teachers to develop rewarding professional competence has made him a role model and mentor to many in the area of foreign language studies. And ladies and gentlemen, it gives me an honor and a pleasure to present to you the 2012 Benny Leadership Award recipient, Morehouse alum, Dr. Herman F. Bostic. Professeur étudiant de Morehouse, Mesdames et Messieurs, bonjour. Bonjour. Mr. President, members of the Board of Trustees, distinguished honorees, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. What I have decided to do this morning, rather than talk too much about what I've done and we've heard, I want to just talk about some anecdotal experiences that I had at Morehouse that guided me in my work after I left Morehouse. And I will try to stay within the time limit. I came to Morehouse in 1945, that's a long time ago, from a small town in Alabama. I graduated valedictorian of my class. So Morehouse gave me a tuition scholarship which was $100, $200, 
creation was a hundred dollar fee per message. I know it's unbelievable. <laughs> and so, but I did not have money for my board and uh, food. So I had to work out something. And so I got a job in the dining hall uh, as an oldest freshman washing the pots and pans in the kitchen. Now, Dr. Franklin, I don't think there's been a wash, pan and pot washer before or after that did it any better than I did. <laughs> <laughs> because Dr. Mays had said to us, whatever job you do, you do it so well that it, that it seems that God sent you in the world to do that. <laughs> so I did my work well, and then I was moved to become student manager of the dining hall. So what I got out of that, that was my first experience of excellence. You do your job so well that people will seek you out. I was a member of the Glee Club, and also the Morehouse Spellman Sports. And I was, as I told you, I ran the dining hall. And you had to finish the meal and clean up the dining hall and lock it before you could go to the uh, rehearsal. And this night, I ran late. And just before 6 o'clock, you know, I realized it was late. I got everything locked up. And I ran all the way from Morehouse to Spell Hall, to Sister Chapel. And I was going to, we were rehearsing for the Christmas Carol concert. And the choir was on the stage, and I was going to ease in on the aisle. And when Mr. Harold saw me, I would be in the in the theater. But I did not realize that Mr. Harold had eyes in the back of his head. So when I walked into the chapel, he politely put down his baton and came back down the aisle and met me halfway to Sister Chapel. And he said, "Son, sit down." So I sat. He said, "Move down." I moved down. And he sat beside me, and he said, you see the clock back there? I said, yes, sir. He said, what time is it? It's been five minutes past six. He said, that's right. He said, but you know, you have never impressed me that you can sing five minutes better than anybody else in that choir. <laughs> so it taught me punctuality. In all of my work, you, my time is important. Do things by the deadline. Begin meetings on time. Now I had Dr. Ace Russell Brooks as English. I was an English major. And I was taking advanced composition from him. And he assigned us a person to interview. And he assigned me a Mr. Lester Granger of the Urban League. And Mr. Granger's office was on the other side of town, off of Auburn Avenue. And I did not want to go over there. And so I concocted an alibi, <laughs> which is another word for a lie. <laughs> uh, and I went in and I told Dr. Brooks that I was having difficulty and I wanted to give me another person. And he was correcting the papers. He never looked up. He said, Mr. Boxley, do you intend to pass advanced composition? And I said, yes, sir. He said, well, you will interview Lester Green. <laughs> so here is another thing, that you do the task that may seem hard, that you may not want to do, but you do not sure. Sometimes you come out the stronger person for having undertaken and tackled that. Then I took economics from Dr. E.B. Williams. And Dr. Williams had a way of calling on the same person the whole 50 minutes. And I had read, he, he did a chapter each day. And so I had read almost two thirds of the chapter and taken my notes. And I got to class and that day he called on me. And he called on me regularly through. And finally I knew he'd get into he was going to pass the way I had read. <laughs> so he finally got to me and I said, Dr. Williams, I'm sorry, but I didn't get the chance to finish the chapter, so I cannot answer that question. And he said, young man, the law does not excuse ignorance. And that is true. You must be prepared. 
if you're going to teach or if you're going to lead, do your homework, do the research, master your family. The second thing was my senior year, I became very upset and I was worried on the spring semester. And I went to Dr. Kuhlman, my major professor, and told him that I was not failing any courses, but I was just uh, upset. I was worried about something. And he said, you know, you're no different from many other seniors. He said, your problem is this. Every summer when you leave, you knew you were going to come back tomorrow. But you know now that when you graduate, you're not coming back. You know what you want to do, but you're not certain. It's that uncertainty that's bothering you. So here is another idea of compassion. A teacher or a leader must be compassionate. You must put your place yourself in the place of the other person. Then the last one, I had a foster father, and I can do this in one minute, who, when I graduated from Morehouse, said to me, when you get the job, if you do it only what they pay you to do, you will never be invited to do what you're capable of doing. These are the things that have guided me through my work. Work well done, punctuality, tackling the task ahead, preparation, excellence in preparation, and going the second. That last line was worth it, wasn't it? Thank you again, Dr. Foster. There is no way in the world that I'm going to interrupt anyone who graduated in 1949. So thank you. You could have had all the time that you wanted. But the next, the next group, you can. All right, our next honoree is Earl the Hilliard Senior Morehouse Class of 1964. An incredible man, might I add. He is a recipient of the 2012 Many Achievement Award. Congressman Earl Hilliard's long career in the state legislature catapulted him into Congress, making him the first black representative from Alabama since Reconstruction. Hilliard is a lifelong Alabama resident and was born in the steelmaking center, or city, I should say, of Birmingham. He grew up in a segregated city and was educated in the city's public schools. He came of age during, and his thinking was fundamentally shaped by civil rights activism during the early 1960s. After receiving a bachelor's degree from Morehouse in 1964, Hilliard received a law degree from Howard University three years later. And in 1970, he earned an MBA, an MBA from Atlanta University. Congressman Hilliard taught at Miles College and worked as an assistant to the president at Alabama State University before becoming a staff attorney for the Legal Aid Society of Jefferson County in Alabama. In the early 1970s, Hilliard went into private practice, which he continues today, but felt that it was time to make good on a promise that he had made to his fellow Morehouse brother, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., years earlier, and that he would become a foot soldier in the war for racial equality. Now, instead of uh, taking his fight to the streets, Hilliard took it to the seat of government. He won a seat in the Alabama House of Representatives where he served from 1975 to 1980. He was then elected to the Alabama State Senate where he served until 1982. And after federal district lines were redrawn in 1992, Hilliard successfully did what no other African American had done since Reconstruction, represent the state of Alabama in the U.S. House of Representatives. And in the Alabama legislature, Hilliard's career focused on helping the urban poor, the bulk of his Birmingham area constituents. He also earned a reputation as a hard-fighting tactical lawmaker. In fact, he once marshaled the votes for a pension bill while the bill's opponent had gone out to eat dinner. So you gotta watch this guy. Outside of the legislature, Hilliard maintained his ties to educational institutions, serving as a trustee at Miles College and Tuskegee Institute. And he has received honors from others, including an honorary Doctor of Humane Letters from Talladega College and the 2011 Outstanding Alumnus Award from the National Alumni Council of the United Negro College Fund. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome the 2012 Benning Achievement Award recipient, Morehouse alum, Earl uh, Hill. <laughs> Dr. Franklin, Morehouse men, and visitors. Thank you. 
There were three keys in my life, I think, that perhaps made me as I am. Be prepared. Dr. Benjamin E. Mayer always stressed that, always told it. The world of my birth in two months can be measured chronologically by counting three scores and 10. The world that I live in today can be measured from my birth until now in the hundreds of light years. In my lifetime, things have changed so fast and so dramatically until it has been difficult Look for those of us who are academically prepared to keep up. The challenge to the students here at Morehouse today is to be prepared for change. Challenge it when necessary, embrace it when needed. But as Dr. Mays would say, as a Morehouse man, the challenge is to be prepared. Being prepared was the first key to my success. I know that the cycle of life to youth is forever. But to those of us who are seniors in this room, know that the cycle of life is merely a day. Therefore, students must forever be prepared because tomorrow in real time is today, and forever in reality is tonight. A Renaissance Morehouse man is someone who is always prepared. In short, always be prepared. Never borrow tomorrow. Be prepared, and as a Renaissance man, do today what others will do tomorrow. Be decisive, take a stand, and stand up and defend your stand. That is the second key to my life's success. Every decision that is made every hour, or should I say every decision that is made every minute will determine in the long term your status in life. One bad split decision in one minute, in one second, can destroy you. When making a decision, Dr. Franklin, a Renaissance Mohouse man will only let positives influence the outcome. Negative elements, negative people, negative vibes should always be avoided and cast aside. Sometimes, you need to get it, unpopular decision will yield positive results. But sometimes, positive, positive decision made by you will yield negative results for others. And sometimes, the right decision, the straight decision, and the positive decision will yield negative results even for you. But the right decision, regardless of the consequences, is always the good decision. As a Renaissance Morehouse man, never be afraid to stand alone. Always make good decisions. The third key, I think, to my success has been that I have never compromised my principles. I am now in the presence of current leaders, and yes, future leaders. I know that I am surrounded by the brightest of the bright, the best of the best, because you are who you are. There will always be temptations to take the easy path, the shortcut, and do the quick fix. Good leadership comes with an expensive process.
price tag. Never compromise personal. It will cost you friendship, maybe. It may deter your efforts to achieve. Sometimes it will cost you a position you have attained. Maybe even some material things that you have. Even your status in life. But a Mohouse man, a Mohouse Renaissance man, must have the courage of his convictions. Because if a man loses a soul, he is but an empty shell. As I and those of my generation exit life stages, your day will come. And in the schemes of things, it will be today, not tomorrow. If I have achieved, if I have become successful, it is because I once sit where you sit. It is because I once stood where you stand. It is because I was taught by Dr. Martin Luther King, E.B. Williams, Dr. Brazil. It is because I had classmates like Meryl Gerald, Dr. Chef Tall, Dr. J.K. Haynes, Dr. Julius Cole, Captain Don Long. It is because I had roommates like Jim Barker, Dr. Elmer Maxwell, Dr. Ernest Murphy. Yes, I was taught by scholars and I was challenged all the days at my Etmo house by my peers. I am because of Mo House. You are privileged to be here. Thank you. Our third honoree is Dr. Calvin McLaurin, an invasive cardiologist and a clinical associate professor of cardiology at Morehouse School of Medicine. He is a recipient of the 2012 Finney Service Award. And now, before we begin talking about his outstanding achievements this morning, many may not know what an invasive cardiologist actually does, because I did not. He is one who specializes in using diagnostic and therapeutic tools that are inserted directly into the patient's body to treat heart disease. Dr. McLaurin is a native Atlantan and received his bachelor's degree from Morehouse in 1968. And he was an early admissions entry into Morehouse after finishing the 10th grade and then skipping the 11th and 12th grades. After graduating from Morehouse, Dr. McLaurin earned a medical degree from Emory University School of Medicine, where he also completed an internship and residency. He then went on to serve in the armed services and is a decorated retired U.S. Army medic, having received the Department of the Army's Commendation Medal for Military Merit. Dr. McLaurin was the first African American to complete the invasive cardiology program at Emory University School of Medicine, and he remains an active member of his profession by participating in numerous professions and professional organizations and societies, including the Atlanta Medical Association, Georgia State Medical Association, and the National Medical Association. Dr. McLaurin serves as the treasurer for the Heritage Fund, the Atlanta Medical Association, which is a foundation that funds scholarships for medical students. And since 1995, the Heritage Fund has granted more than $400,000 in scholarships. And student recipients have attended schools such as Howard University College of Medicine, the Harry Medical College, and the Morehouse School of Medicine. He is a fellow of the American College of Chest Physicians, a fellow of the American College of Cardiology, a member of Omega Sci Fi Fraternity Incorporated, and Phi Delta Epsilon Medical Fraternity. He has also received accolades and awards from numerous organizations, including Who's Who in Black Atlanta, the Top Physicians Awards from the Consumers Research Council of America, and the Medical Trailblaze Award from Pfizer Pharmaceuticals. He also served as the co-chairman of the Medical Command Center for the 1996 Atlanta Olympics. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Morehouse alum and 2012 Benny Service Award honoree, Dr. Calvin Wayne McLaughlin. <laughs> Good morning. I'm very happy to be here. I'm also very happy to participate and deal with the Morehouse family. As the resume summary that was given to you 
just said, I'm from here, I'm from Atlanta, and I uh, actually grew up in the Mid Hill area, and after that, in uh, Allensville, went to Turner High School, Harper High School, Morehouse College. It's interesting, uh, I was in a pre-college program at Morehouse back in 1964. And at that time, I had decided I was gonna go into medicine. And it was interesting, all my friends were coming to me and saying, well, you know, if you go into medicine, that means that uh, we're gonna be out making money while you are still in school. So you're still gonna be broke. And of course, with being young at that particular time and reactionary to what people say, say to you and how it will control your life, I said, well, I know what I do. I heard about this pre-college program. I heard about going to college as an early admission student. So after I went to uh, the summer program that summer at Morehouse uh, after talking to my, uh, my father and my uh, sister, had them talk to the appropriate people to see whether or not I could come to Morehouse two years early. And uh, of course, I did do that. What was interesting about that phenomenon, why I told you that, about that is that sometimes your friends and the people around you can discourage you from doing things, but that shouldn't happen to you. You need to make up your mind what you want to do, decide which way you want to do things, and stick to that. I told my mother I was going to go uh, early admission to a mo house after we got it worked out. And uh, she looked at me and said, son, you almost flunked out of the 10th grade. What makes you think that you can go to Morehouse house early admission and do well? Now my almost flunked out the 10th grade to my mother was that uh, I made five A's and one B. And uh, so I said, okay, mother, I'll show you. Now, it took me years to learn that uh, my mother knew how to manipulate me. She knew by telling me that I was not gonna do it right, I was gonna do it. And I was gonna prove, prove to her that I could get things done. And that set my life. And, and throughout my life, high school, college, medical school, uh, she learned how to, like I said, to manipulate me to get me to do things. We sort of developed a quotation out in my uh, family that has been passed on to my kids, that no task is too hard to conquer, no goal is too hard to achieve, to be as to believe. I believe, I believe in God, I believe in family, and most of all, I believe in myself. So what I've done all these years and trying to be successful is one, sticking to the things I wanted to do, listening to others and try to proceed in doing the things I want to do, but also having great respect for my family and knowing that uh, my mother could manipulate me. And she was very successful in doing that. One of the things that come up then, well, how has that affected your, able to, your ability to practice medicine? Well, one of the things that was, to me that was most important about practicing medicine is that when I went out, there were no Afro-American cardiologists here in the city. I'm from Atlanta. And I was smart enough and very happily to say that, that I respected the physicians that had been here. The physicians, although they might not have been trained at some of the schools and places I had been trained, but they were physicians, they knew about the community, they knew how to deal with people, they knew how to deal with patients. My life was about taking care of patients, seeing people, and talking to them and understanding. The key to my success, and I'm not, not sure I'm really answering the question that uh, you've asked me to answer, but the key to my success, I think, has been the fact that I respected the physician and all the people in the community that knew what was happening and had asked me to do certain things. Respect for my elders was my key to success. Respect for my parents. When I was born, my mother was 42 years old, so by the time I was in medical school, uh, she was much older. My parents died when they were 83 years old. My father first, when he was 83, then my mother. But the key to all this is that having respect for the people around you, which is also is what Morehouse did for me. It gave me more respect for my elders, for the people who were training me and teaching me. No task is too hard to conquer, no goal is too hard to achieve. 
to be a true believer. I believe in God, I believe in family, I believe in myself. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And uh, thank you and congratulations again to each of our 2012 Benny Award winners. So now it is my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Earl Stafford. He is the head of the Wentworth Group, LLC, a Western Virginia-based holding company that provides counseling, business, and financial support to small companies that cater to the federal market. Now today, Morehouse College is celebrating his accomplishments and honoring him as a recipient of the 2012 Candle in Business and Humanitarian Service. Now, Earl W. Stafford grew up as a PK kid, a preacher's kid, so you know what they say about him, they are bad. But he's an exception, they're good. The longtime Northern Virginia businessman and philanthropist grew up in New Jersey as one of 12 children of a Baptist minister. His father did manual labor to support his large family while his mother worked as a domestic. And even with that reality, Stafford never felt poor. He and his siblings developed a strong work ethic at an early age, and for example, whenever they needed money, they collected soda bottles, cut lawns, or performed other tasks to earn what they needed. So they worked really hard. But before entering the corporate world, Stafford had a successful 20-year distinguished career in the United States Air Force that included service as the Assistant Air Force Liaison Officer to the Federal Aviation Administration. In 1988, Stafford started Universal Systems and Technology Incorporated, Unitech, which provided interactive training and simulation tools to the military. He served as chairman and CEO of the company until he sold it in 2009. Even while pursuing two careers, earning a college degree and an MBA in his spare time, in his spare time, <coughs> Stafford never forgot his PK roots. And his philanthropic contributions have been in the form of investing in the underprivileged. This is my favorite story. In 2002, he founded the faith-based nonprofit organization, the Stafford Foundation Incorporated. This organization provides assistance to the, to the economically distressed and assists them in helping others as they climb to the top. It was through this work that Stafford came up with the idea for the People's Inaugural Ball, and he envisioned an event that would bring people from across the country to Washington, D.C to celebrate the swearing in of the nation's first African-American president, Barack Obama. With the help of about 40 other nonprofits, Stafford invited more than 300 people to the nation's capital. Guests as this groundbreaking event included the homeless, battered women, wounded veterans, and the mentally and physically disabled. He provided them with a first-class experience that included everything from luxury accommodations at the JW Marriott Hotel and tuxedos in Balga. And Stafford continues to look for ways to do more. The Stafford Foundation recently launched the People's Project and the Doing Good campaign to continue helping the underserved become self-reliant and live in dignity. It is my pleasure to welcome our 2012 Candle recipient in Business and Humanitarian Service, Mr. Earl W. Stafford. those kind words. I don't have anything scripted, but I do, I always acknowledge and thank Jesus Christ as the head of my life for all the good that happens in my life, and I don't want to make an exception today. I thank Chairman Davidson and President um, Franklin for the invitation to be here. I was sitting there thinking, I said, my Lord, my Lord, after hearing the wonderful stories that preceded me and what's coming after me, I sure wish I had gone first. I really do. <laughs> but I do. In just a very brief uh, uh, few minutes, um, I'd like to just go over my childhood and reiterate some of the things in the, uh, my bio. Not because they were so remarkable, but because some of the things that happened in my childhood and as I came along had an impact on my life and in shaping some of the decisions that I made later in my life. As was mentioned, I was uh, one of 12 children born to uh, mom and dad. Uh, in Mount Holly, New Jersey. I had a wonderful childhood in coming up. I came up in an environment uh, that was somewhat old-fashioned, where you called and addressed adults as yes sir and yes ma'am, that if you wanted money, you needed something, you went out and wore, you collected bottles, you shoveled snow and washed cars and did those kind of things. It was just a wonderful coming up. Um, some of the people that were instrumental in my life and I didn't realize at the time, one was a 
little usher who was probably four foot nine in high heels and Miss Ada Mason. Now Miss Ada didn't play. I think I've seen her smile twice in her life. But she was a uh, very instrumental person in my life. I remember one Saturday morning, I was uh, early Saturday morning, I was sitting on the porch with my baseball and my glove, and I was waiting for Daryl Simpson, Harold Anderson, and some of the other guys because we were going to go and play baseball in the field near the factory. And Miss Ada pulled up, walked right past me, never acknowledged me, stuck her head in my door and said, Miss Mabel, I'm going to take your boy out and we're going to sell hot dogs and soda. And my mother was inside the house. She said, all right, Miss Ada. Never asked me if I wanted to go. They just walked past me and said, come on. And so I got in the car, and I was really disappointed because I wanted to go play baseball with the fellas. And that summer, I sold hot dogs and sodas. She taught me how to buy hot dogs wholesale and to resell them. She taught me how to buy sodas. She taught me how to put up signs and those type of things to attract people as they came by. And at the end of the day, we made a couple of dollars. Now, in my grumbling and self-pitying because the other guys were having fun, I never realized that I was getting an education in business, even then. Um, but I did that. I learned, worked in the grocery store, um, and grew up in the hometown. I didn't go directly to college, but went into the military uh, during the Vietnam era and took advantage of some of the educational opportunities that were, that were there. Uh, and received my undergraduate degree and my MBA while I was in the military. After 20 years, I decided to uh, retire and to go into business. And that was a big step for me because my wife and I, and she's there, she can tell you, we were just very, very, we were very much in debt and we were struggling. And um, I decided that we were going to start a company and to go out and she was after me, why don't you just go and get a job? But uh, we, we took the chance, we took the risk, and uh, we just went for it, and it worked out. I will say something that she has never heard before. In my first 13 years of business, I had my house collateralized uh, against the line of credit and some of the loans. And I know I would have had more gray hairs if she had known that at the time, so I'll confess that, confess that to you. Uh, we kept on, and, and some of the lessons that I learned as obstacles came up and as they will with any success story, that I did not and was able not to separate my faith from my endeavors. I didn't want to separate that which I sang and shouted out on Sunday morning and forget about it on Monday morning. My business, we had difficult times the 21 years we were in business. And things seemed to take a turn, not seem, they did take a turn after about 16 years when I stepped back and made Christ the chairman of the board in my company. Now that sounds cute, but it's real. When I decided to get out from in front of my life and my endeavors and to engage my faith in that, then things started to happen. And so I've learned that, that my faith is not a separate part of my life, but it has to be an integral part of my life. I got a minute and 30, I better talk quickly. One of the most significant things that happened in my life happened in 2002. I got a call from my pastor, then the Reverend Dr. John O. Peterson, that some of you might know, and he called me at work. Now, when your pastor calls you at work, you know something's up. And he called me and he said, Diggin' Stafford. Now, I got nervous because he and I were very close and he always called me Earl, so I knew something was up. He said, I want you to go on a mission trip to Haiti to help rebuild some churches. And immediately I came up with every excuse of why I couldn't and why I shouldn't go to Haiti. Well, Pastor, you know I'm busy and, and I'm trying to uh, run this business and well, all to no avail. He sent me to Haiti three weeks later. I was in Port-au-Prince. And when I went down there and I saw the people, I saw that they weren't looking for a handout that they were looking just for a hand so that they can live their lives in dignity. It opened up my eyes uh, to not only the opportunities and responsibilities that we have overseas, but those who are underserved, those who are hurting right around where I was. And that experience that I didn't want to go on, that trip I didn't want to take, that mission project that I tried to shy away from was a life transforming experience. And at that time, I decided to dedicate my life to doing good in life, 
regardless if I'm employed or not, but we all have an opportunity, we have a responsibility, no, we have an obligation to do good, even where we are. So that has had an impact in my life and it continues to guide my life. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Last but not least, our next honoree is Dr. Robert Michael Franklin, the 10th president of Morehouse College. He is the recipient of the 2012 Candle in Education. And prior to returning to his alma mater as president, Dr. Franklin served as the Presidential Distinguished Professor of Social Ethics at Emory University's Candler School of Theology. And following that role, he then served as president of the Interdenominational Theological Center. He also served as a program officer in the Human Rights and Social Justice Program at the Ford Foundation. Dr. Franklin is considered a leading scholar and teacher in the fields of social ethics, psychology, and African American religion. An educator, Dr. Franklin has been a faculty member at the University of Chicago, Harvard Divinity School, Colgate Rochester Divinity School, and Emory University. And following his sabbatical, he will return to Morehouse College as a distinguished professor of social ethics. Dr. Franklin grew up in Chicago, Chi-Town, and earned a bachelor's degree from Chi-Town, Chi-Town House, and earned a bachelor's degree in political science and religion from Morehouse. He then attended Harvard Divinity School, where he earned a Master of Divinity in Christian Social Ethics and Pastoral Care in 1978. In 1985, he earned a PhD in Ethics and Society, Religion, and the Social Sciences from the University of Chicago Divinity School. And in 1973, he received an English Speaking Union Scholarship to attend the University of Durham in England. In addition to his own degrees, he has also received honorary degrees from Bethune-Cookman University, Bates College, and Swarthmore College. A public theo theologian, President Franklin is a noted author and frequent commentator on national public radio's All Things Considered. And fellow scholar Cornell West has called him one of the most prophetic leaders and visionary thinkers of our generation. His scholarly works speak to academics, church leaders, and lay people. His scholarship and leadership has moved us to rethink the role of education in the larger world and to renew our sense of responsibility for reshaping that world. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand to your feet and welcome your president, Dr. Robert Michael Franklin. <laughs> Good morning and greetings to all, Mr. Provost, fellow honorees, to First Lady Cheryl Franklin. They say behind every successful man there is a supportive wife and a surprised mother-in-law. I want to thank my wife and mother-in-law for their presence here this morning and for all of you, Chairman Davidson and colleagues. What a distinguished uh, group of panelists and honorees we celebrate today here at Morehouse College. Each of these men has had an impact on my life. Uh, I am not worthy to sit with you. Dr. Bostic taught me French. He was a professor extraordinaire. And what an honor to be with you, my former professor. I've always said Morehouse dormitories are unlike residence halls and other institutions. They are dream incubators. And as we sat in the dormitories, those dream incubators on this campus, I looked to Washington, D.C. All of my fellow students in LLC, then Thurman Hall, said, Franklin, you're going to Congress one day. I said, oh, no way. But they said, there's got to be Morehouse men in Congress. And there was Earl Hilliard in Congress representing us. And then later, of course, and today we have Sanford Bishop, Cedric Richmond, and I see young men here who will someday serve in Congress. We need a U.S. Senator, brothers. brothers. In addition, Calvin McLaren, what an extraordinary, cool, understated, brilliant physician, sought after all over the world for his expertise. The brother not only works on the heart, he works inside the heart. And I have sought his advice uh, on various occasions as I have aged and sought advice about keeping the heart healthy. And Dr. McLaren, you've been a great friend and a fellow Porsche file. And then my dear friend, Earl Stafford, what an extraordinary leader. I've been so deeply impressed with you and your wife's commitment to uplifting the least advantaged in our community. And that is at the core of the Morehouse value proposition we don't look at who is the rich and the powerful, who's at the top of the pyramid, but who are the least advantaged in the community. 
and Morehouse men identify with them and try to lift them. So Earl Stafford, you are a Morehouse man at heart. I'm so grateful, Mr. Moderator. Yes. Now my five minutes should begin, please. <laughs> I do wish to uh, call attention to two simple ideas. The first of them, you know that I'm a teacher at heart and I can't wait to get back to the classroom, my first calling. And uh, thank you, Chairman and the Board, for understanding my deep desire to love and serve this college by returning to what I know God has called me to do in these next few years of my life as I approach the terrifying age of 60. But the first idea, young men, I wish you to hold on to is something developed by the great German philosopher Hegel. Hegel, H-E-G-E-L. Google it, do some study this very afternoon. Why? When Martin Luther King was locked up on one occasion, when released, he walked out of that little Albany jail and reporters from all over the country were gathered around and asked, who was the most influential thinker in your intellectual uh, big view of the world? King said, Hegel, and kept walking. They looked at who? Hegel. Never heard of him. I want you to know who Hegel is. He created this notion of the dialectic. Strange word. How do we move from, how do we make change happen in history? How is it if you look at the history of the world, early on, only one person, one man was free? The Pharaoh of Egypt, the king of Israel, the monarch the king in England, one man free. And over time you look and something happens. A few are free, can vote, can own property. How did you get from one man to now the few, the oligarchy, the elite? And that idea carried us for a long time until today, the notion that all could be free, all could vote. Hegel said, I have an app for that. I have an explanation for that. There's a concept called dialectical idealism, where there is, you begin with one man free monarchy, a thesis, and soon unrest and discontent among the people challenge the thesis. They represent the anti-thesis. They say, well, more than one can be free. Surely the, the well-educated can be free. And the anti-thesis, or pronounced antithesis, collides with the thesis. The king is fighting and holding on, but the people are saying, wait a minute, we also want to participate. Thesis, antithesis, as they clash, they produce a new, whole new system, the synthesis. And over time, democracy represents such a synthesis. So brothers, I wanted you to take that. Why do I focus on that? Karl Marx learned from his teacher, Hegel, Hegel's system was called dialectical idealism, but Marx called it dialectical materialism, as he talked about how political systems clash and produce new forms of change. In Birmingham, Martin King is sitting in a jail thinking about how do we move from an apartheid, from a few white males free, to all of us free, all of God's children. He's thinking about Hegel and the dialectic operating in history. I want you to identify those systems that oppress people today, that exploit and destroy, destroy human flourishing, and you must pose, formulate the antithesis to challenge those systems of injustice that will produce something beyond the new Jim Crow incarcerating so many young brothers. We must push toward that new synthesis. Finally, the idea I wish to place before you brothers as you think about the dialectic and in your lives what you will challenge. Always have an elevator speech. I'm giving a poor example of it here today. I'm running over my time, I recognize. But I want each of you always have a 67, 60 second version of your story. This will carry you a long way. We can talk more about it during the Q&A. But I have found, even in fundraising trips, when you only have a few minutes on the elevator to ride up to the 15th floor, be able to tell the story of Morehouse, your story, whatever it is you wish to encapsulate the highlights, which means you gotta write it down, you gotta memorize it, you have to practice it and internalize it. So, as I sat as a new president with 40 other presidents at Harvard University, School of Education in 2007, 
and they went around and they asked, okay, you all are about to become new college presidents. I'd like to hear the story of your vision of your college. The room sat silent. No credit to me, but I'd learned from Mays and Gloucester and Massey and Sheptal always have the 60-second version of your story, of your mission, of your institution. And as I prayed about it and thought about it and looked at the life of Howard Thurman, Martin King, Benjamin Mays, the Morehouse men in my life, I said, Morehouse, they produce Renaissance men with social conscience and global perspective. So when they asked, is there no one here? You are about to be presidents of great colleges, and no one here can, it kept people started reciting the language in the catalog. He said, no, I don't want to hear that. What is your version? And I said, sir, Morehouse College was founded in 1867. We produce Renaissance men with social conscience, capsulated in the Morehouse mystique, summarized in five wells. We are well-read, well-spoken, well-traveled, well-dressed, and well-balanced and the room erupted in ovation. God bless you. The doors of the church are now open. <laughs> At this time, ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna open it up for questions. Please keep your speeches, keep your stories. You can save them for after the event, but I'm going to ask you questions and direct them to one person. I believe there's a mic on each side, and we'll be available on each side of the, uh, uh, yeah, she's going to bring it down. Uh, but if you could uh, start making your way toward the front side on each side, and uh, be prepared to direct your questions again to one person. So you can keep the We're doing okay in time. You see your first and last name first, and uh, tell us who you represent. Thank you for the opportunity to ask this question. I have two questions. You always have to have more than one question if you're a Morehouse man. First question I would like to direct to Dr. Bostick. One of the things that I found in my own experience in dealing with higher education is the lack of interest in learning languages and students uh, becoming encouraged uh, to learn uh, difficult languages, including also the modern languages that you teach. And I know that we've emphasized the development of the Chinese program. We have some 300 students enrolled in that. But we need more students engaged in learning different languages of the world. And I'd like to have your views on what you feel about that, given your Morehouse experience and given your Howard experience. What do you think ought to be done to encourage students to study languages? The second question I wanted to direct to what I consider the Renaissance man, Morehouse, our own president. I want to thank you for what you have done for this institution. The moral and ethical guidance that you have given us has really been an inspiration, not only to the faculty, but to the students. And the question I would ask you, as you leave this great institution for better things, I hope, because you deserve it, what do you see as the greatest problem confronting this institution for the next five years? Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. This country, when it was founded, you see it's bordered on each side by an ocean, so we were separated. And also we struggled so to build our own culture. And we did not look too much at the learning of other languages. And there are two other reasons. Can you, can you hear me? We had a sort of isolation philosophy at the beginning of this country. And I want to answer this in two ways. One was that, that we focused on building the United States of America. And of course, the language was English. And then also, and I said this once, Dr. Franklin, I got in trouble at a national conference. We really turned the teaching of foreign languages over to foreigners. And that posed a problem. The other thing is this, that the matter of teaching, Howard Thurman said one time that it's not what you need, but you need to make the class alive. And so for a long time, we taught 
foreign language as Latin, you had to learn the grammar and all of it before you could speak. And that was a burden. And it, 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 in, the, in the modern time, they didn't see the importance of that. Rather than teaching the language from its own perspective and using the language in the classroom, I can give you an example. When I was here at Morehouse, I took Spanish. And I had a teacher who was a Phi Beta Kappa, not on the faculty at Morehouse, by the way. Uh, but we spent a whole year translating. We said nothing in Spanish. The next year, I had a Spanish teacher who was on the faculty at Morehouse who said nothing in English. So that's the problem. It's a matter of teaching. We have not trained teachers to really teach language from a language, a language perspective. And that has been our problem. I think we have overcome some of that. I tried to do that in forming the Southern Conference on Language Teaching and also the College Language Association and uh, that. So we are moving from that now. And you could see some of that yesterday when the two young men gave their, their presentation in uh, Chinese. And it was very well done. Their pronunciation, their accents were excellent. Thinking to myself, I'm gonna have to fight Dr. Boston to get my microphone back. <laughs> Let's all go to here for my Dr. Franklin now. In an effort to facilitate the maximum number of uh, questions and answers, I'll be very brief. What I would say, Professor Julius Coles was an extraordinary leader, an international visionary, former president of Africare. I want every student to get to know. Julius Coles, who directs here at Morehouse, the Andrew Young Inter Center for International Studies. Uh, one is mundane, the economics, the financial wherewithal to enable students to focus on their studies, get the best out of Morehouse without worrying of being distracted by paying the bills. That's going to be one of the great challenges. And the board is fully aware, and the team will be working and will continue. Uh, in this uh, next capital campaign to focus on scholarship dollars to enable students to complete. We all know that. But the second is, is, is moral, from the mundane to the moral. And that's ensuring that Morehouse culture, what happens on, in classrooms, in the chapel, in the athletic programs, in the cafeteria, that there are people who get that, who understand that in order to get Morehouse into the lives of these young men and our values, we have to sort of become intertwined in their lives. And that's one of the great things about the great Morehouse faculty. Every Morehouse man in here could talk about one or two or three faculty, and all of you have teachers who changed your life because you knew before they taught you anything, they cared about you. They saw your potential. And that's why my life has changed at Morehouse, because there were those professors like Dr. Bostick and like so many others, Robert Brisbane, E.B. Williams, E.A. Jones. The other uh, French teacher uh, at Morehouse in those days was Edward A. Jones. You know that name because he wrote the history book, Candle in the Dark. But he also, after French class, would offer, he said, any young man who wish to remain to learn how to tie a bow tie, I will teach you that. Now, where else do you get that? And he taught us painstakingly how to, uh, how to tie a tie. He said, I don't want you wearing clip-on ties. That is for little school children. You must learn how to tie a bow tie as a Morehouse gentleman. So it's that kind of intrusive, caring presence in the lives of these young men. And I certainly hope and am very grateful to the for the invitation of the board to return uh, as a faculty member. There's something I'd love to do and be a part of that great faculty of Morehouse to join you, Julius, and John Williams, and Chef Tall, and others who are here uh, to carry on that tradition. All right, tomorrow night. Hello, how are you doing this afternoon? My name is Kevin Harvey. I'm a freshman business manager major for Women's in Delaware. My question is for Mr. Stafford. I'm very interested in community investment in nonprofit organizations. I was wondering what your first step in starting the Stafford Foundation was. In deciding to start a foundation, I, I personally think it's great. Uh, 
one of the concerns I had is too often, in the last 20 years, there's been a plethora of nonprofit <laughs> organizations that have evolved, uh, well intentioned, but lacking really capacity and impact. <coughs> and one of the things I encourage, sometimes if you're really concerned about the impact, the results, then perhaps we don't need to start another organization, but get involved in an organization that already exists, if that is really our focus. Now, if you have something unique to offer, uh, and something of value, that's a different story. But there are many viable organizations out there, specifically, and particularly in the minority communities, that we should be getting involved in, and getting involved with, to help them move forward. Thank you, sir. And thank you. I'm not sure if the uh, audio booth can hear me, but if it's possible, if you could just open everybody's mic uh, on the stage so we won't have to go back and forth. Go ahead. Good afternoon. My name is Lance Dixon. I'm a senior English major, originally from Miami, Florida, here at Morehouse College. And my question, I don't want to break from the rules too much, but I'm sort of posing it to Mr. Stafford and to Dr. Franklin. Mr. Stafford, in your story and in your resume, it spoke about how you en enlisted programs to sort of look out for the least of these, as the Bible mentions and talks about. And so I'm wondering, what do you all see as the potential least of these in the coming years? And as we look at society today, who are we? Who should we be looking to? And who is, who are the most disenfranchised people that perhaps aren't getting the type of media coverage or aren't in the forefront as opposed to others that we're more familiar with in history? Well, unfortunately, when we talk about the disenfranchised and the underserved, um, here the poor, uh, before we used to think about just the homeless and those who are on the street. But there are many who are underserved and disenfranchised who are right around us that oftentimes have a masquerade on that are hurting, and they look like you and me, okay? Um, and I'm sorry, I forgot the other part of your question. Oh, well, I was, I was just wondering about how do we further identify who those people are because so much of media attention goes to, as you mentioned, like just homeless and people that in food banks and things like that, but how do we look for the less popularized or the people who are, as you say, sort of cloaked behind these different things and are in serious need of help, but we aren't able to identify them as easily? They, those that you speak of are your neighbors. Mm -hmm. Those are those who live next door to you, that go to school with you, who work with you. And I think if we would learn to lead with our ear more and to listen to what they're really saying, and to better understand their situation, then there's an opportunity for us to be of help and to be involved. That doesn't always mean financially, you know. Sometimes, we, we, we oftentimes we can really have an impact by listening, by being a friend, by, by encouraging, and, and, and providing those type of resources in addition to financial resources. Here's an excellent exercise. Wow. <clears throat> Oh, say it more. Uh, think about, just now in your mind, three identities that you possess that render you part of a majority. And think about three identities you possess right now that render you part of a minority. The bottom line of the exercise, focus on individuals who are multiple minorities. As majority, I'm a male, well, not necessarily numeric in the world, but power-wise, the differential of power over women. That makes me, no matter how powerless I feel as a male in American society that distributes power based on gender, males have power and are majority. As a Christian in this nation, I am part of a majority. As an educated person, I am, and you can go on and on, do it in your own mind. And then what about the minorities of race, ethnicity, etc.? And I think as you move through that exercise, you get a taste of what I'll be doing in social ethics courses around here. As you move through the exercise, part of what you would focus on is who are the multiple minorities? We speak English. Who doesn't speak English very well? Immigrants, heterosexuals are the majority, homosexual, LBGTQ community, 
sexual identity orientation minorities, people living with HIV AIDS and disease. Uh, people, so you, you begin to get this frame that might point to your moral compass toward if Jesus or Muhammad or Buddha or, or here directing me to align at least 10% of my time and money with the least advantaged in the world today, I have a moral obligation to focus on the multiple minorities. Thank you. Uh, this question is directed at uh, Congressman Hilliard. Uh, we've watched politics over the last couple of decades, maybe the last three decades, switch from being about the issues more into a dialogue about politics, partisanship, and uh, just plain you know, campaigning. What is it that young people, specifically college-age people, have, what do they have to do to get that dialogue pushed back to one about the issues, specifically those issues dealing with uh, the people who live in the communities surrounding places like Morehouse? Would you repeat that? I'm sorry. <laughs> what, do we have, what are young people, college-age people, going to have to do to uh, push the political uh, dialogue back into one about issues instead of partisanship? Was it for Hilliard? Yeah, to Hilliard. Okay. He's asking for Congress. Yeah. That's Frank. Would you repeat that question? As I understand it, you should, actually, you should make the moderator earn his keep here. But, uh, <laughs> make me work for it, right? You know what? If you can speak up in that mic, I think you have to uh, speak up clearly. Uh, then that should work out. Can you hear me better now? Okay, what do we have to do, specific, specifically college-age students, what will they have to do in the future to push the political conversation away from partisan, politi poli partisan politics back to the one about issues, specifically those okay. issues dealing with those people who live in communities surrounding colleges like Morehouse? You know, about two years ago, the uh, United States, I'm sorry, the Supreme Court issued a ruling that let super PACs come forth with money and that they could be, as long as they were divorced from any candidates, they could talk about the policies of any candidate. And when those super PACs came forth, <clears throat> the first thing they did, they talked about the negatives. So they took the conversation away from issues, and they only focus on the negative of those persons that they were against. Now, some of those super PACs have connections, even though they are not supposed to in law with certain candidates. So they talk about and speak about the negative of the of opposition. As you have seen unfolding in the Republican Party, as one person rises to the top, and they said, this is our candidate, this is going to be the party nominee, all of a sudden, everything negative, if there is nothing negative, everything is created that's negative about him. And he falls back in the pack. So we, the Supreme Court, and really the United States Congress, got to destroy the finances for these super PACs that allows them. Even the president is against it, but he realizes that he has to have one. And until those are destroyed, we won't be able to get the conversation in the media campaign focuses back to the real issue. And uh, just a quick note, I'm gonna be asking a question from this mic, make sure you shout, it's a little hard for us on this end. Uh, to hear and uh, understand. We have a quick question before we come to you, uh, my brother. Uh, about a week or two ago, there was an article in the HFC that talked about the numbers of African American males attending HBCUs are down significantly. What do you have, or what can you suggest for Morehouse students and also Morehouse alums to get those numbers up? And not just at Morehouse, but HBCUs across the country. Anybody can talk about it. 
Well, let me just offer a short answer about something that some of the young men in this audience are doing, and that's becoming more involved in pre-college prep programs. So on Morehouse's campus, we have over 1,200 young people, young, young boys and girls, every summer involved in something that uh, former Provost Weldon Jackson created along with Dr. Ann Watts, and they deserve credit for crafting a brilliant idea that is called Summer Academy. Over 15 programs with Morehouse faculty and Morehouse students teaching. And here are sixth and seventh grade junior high, high school kids on the road, discovering a college campus, learning science, technology, math, health careers, etc. So I think that more pre-college exposure, because what we're finding, especially for African-American boys, there's a culture of stigma as being smart. So these young brothers are showing up at Morehouse saying, we couldn't even carry a physics textbook around in public for fear of getting beaten up in our home neighborhood. Any study and idea was online at home almost in secret. I mean, just outrageous things happening in many of our villages. That's the crisis in the village. So how we correct that? And at Morehouse, they come here and they feel it's okay to be smart. Everybody in here is smart. We challenge in a friendly way and push one another. And so it's, it's been a real phenomenal experience for those kids. But pre-college experience and urging them to join college clubs uh, to, to, to work on their study skills. Yes, you know, and one of the biggest problems that African Americans have in education is the fact that there are so many students that drop out of high school. They never finish, never get the opportunity, they never go back. So that destroys the number of African-American males eligible to attend college. So we got to do something about the dropout rate, especially in inner city school. Definitely. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is James Brown. I'm a junior psychology philosopher that will major from Albany, Georgia. And my question is to you, Dr. Franklin. Um, you've truly been avant-garde. You've truly brought the renaissance to Morehouse College, and we appreciate that. And my question is, how do you see us as students continuing that renaissance? And not only that, the students bring the renaissance to the community and developing our hometowns and bringing a new motivation to our society. Because I see there's a lack of motivation, and without motivation, I don't see there can be change. So how do you think that students can bring that that trailblazer mentality and that renaissance mentality to our institution? Well, the short version, I think, as we study the nature of power and how, back to the point of how change occurs, always try to diagnose in every social situation the pressure points, the key influencers. And if you only have limited hours of the day to work on this, make sure you're focusing it in the right place. Where are the levers for change? In this instance, I think that uh, you have a strong coalition of trustees, of faculty, of alumni, of parents, and others who, again, I think have supported this vision of, uh, of the Renaissance and the Five Wells. Uh, certainly not you know, for anything to do with my ego, over, but what's good for Morehouse. And I think that as we move through this period of transition, we can work together to ensure that, 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 that those emphases, even if it's called something else, every new president has a right to do that, that just as Dr. Massey said to me, Doc, you have the right to reformulate how you present that. I said, thank you, President Massey, that helps me. And my successor needs that as well. But let's ensure that the fundamental values, whatever we call them, uh, remain in place and be a part of what this next phase for our great college. So let's look at the influencers, trustees, alumni, uh, faculty, that's key. The other is in exporting the Renaissance. Where are the key influencers there? Who has power in these neighborhoods, even the most impoverished neighborhoods? Pastors, neighborhood community organizers, neighborhood association presidents, and local businesses and merchants. And so I would urge us to be focused on those people who have influence and assets in the community. Get them on board, cultivate them, take the charm offensive of Morehouse to them, 
And once they embrace us, they'll support our effort. Thank you, Dr. Frank. This is for each one of the honorees, uh, starting with you, Dr. Bostic. I'd like you to only have one choice. I'd like you to decide, tell me what one person that you have either, you've either met or read about that has most influenced you in your life and encompasses your personal values. One person that has most influenced you and encompassed your personal values. Start with Dr. Boston. Thank you. Well, I would have to say uh, Dr. Mays and much of what I said this morning really flowed from his impression on me. I remember him saying once that to do your work so well that people would hear about you and that if a job becomes vacant in your field, you may not get it, but your name ought to be mentioned. <laughs> and that has guided me. And I must say here today, I have never applied for a job. And I took that from Dr. Mays. Every position that I have filled was offered to me. So I could say that Dr. Mays influenced my whole life. And I'm very thankful for it. I have always said that it was Dr. E.B. Williams. Dr. E.B. Williams was my advisor when I got here. At one time, I did not have sufficient funds to stay in college. And I went to Dr. Williams and I talked with him. And the next thing I knew, he had sent me to Mr. Lockett, who took care of the situation. When I got in trouble several times when I was at Mohawk. And uh, at one time, I thought I would be expelled. But once again, Dr. Williams came to the, to the rescue. Uh, Dr. Williams was always there. Uh, I came here wanting to be a lawyer, wanting to major in political science. But his influence was so great, I went into business and economics. Dr. Wheat. And even when I had finished the Morehouse requirement and had been drafted to go to Vietnam, it was Dr. Williams that got me in graduate school and a deferment. It, it, no question it was Dr. Williams. It's <laughs> Dr. Yeah, it's interesting because I'm sitting here thinking, who would I give that credit to? And and I know yeah. we've talked, we've talked uh, about a lot of people that influence our lives. If I look at Morehouse, believe it or not, it would be my French teacher, <laughs> and my French teacher was Morrow still. Hmm. Okay. I had a lot of respect for him. He communicated with the students. He read, we had book clubs and things together, and uh, it was Mark Stilton. I don't have a Morehouse example, but uh, when I look back over my life, I, and this sounds almost cliche-ish, but my father. I, 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 I uh, thank God for my father for not only the wisdom that he imparted in me, the things that he taught me, or the discipline that he instilled, uh, we didn't take too many votes in my house. Uh, <laughs> came, uh, going to church or doing certain things. But uh, he showed in many ways his love, his character. He was always there. And uh, for the example of not quitting, with 12, 12 children and the burden that he had, it was easy to walk away, but he never did. And uh, a great influence on life. Bob, it's a great question. It's unfair, though. Uh, I would have to say my pre-Morehouse years is my grandmother. I grew up in her house, and I watched my grandmother walk out of her house, off her front porch one day when the Blackstone Rangers and the gangster disciples were about to go to war, and she stopped a riot. So she became, for me, a leader. Good afternoon. 
My name is Ernest Brooks, and I serve as an associate campus minister here at Morehouse. Uh, my question uh, is for Dr. Franklin first, and I uh, would like others, uh, as they see fit, to uh, maybe chime in. Uh, one of the programs uh, that we have in the chapel is focused on the exploration of vocation, and we're focused on helping uh, the students, the men of Morehouse, uh, begin to discern who they are, what they're called to do, what their passion is, and where, they're, where, where they feel their gifts and talents taking them. And this past Thursday, after our chapel assistance meeting, a few of us uh, went to dinner, and we had a conversation about balancing ambition and calling, and how you live in this tension between one's ambition and what you feel called to do, and how you find what's, what makes you passionate in life. And uh, the question that I have is, how do you deal with being a multi-talented individual, having, you know, being ambitious, having doors open for you, being able to go anywhere and do anything, but how do you balance yourself and discipline yourself to do those things that you're called to do and not just take advantage of every opportunity that opens uh, because of your ambition? That's a great question. I need more time to think about it. But uh, at first blush, I would say that, um, that it does come down to making choices and to uh, honesty and to the courage that has to step forth to, to guide one. Uh, needless to say, there's been an interesting period of discernment for me, uh, an opportunity to, to continue in a role that I love, but that I understand uh, will require uh, a focus and a long-term commitment and a number of demands and expectations that are in tension with something deep in my soul that says, as I interact with so many boys and men of color, not just at Morehouse, but around the nation, where am I likely to give the greatest value, have the greatest impact? And there is something in me calling for more writing and teaching and media presence and being in the streets and lingering with the homeboys and doing what my grandmother did with the gangbangers and going into prison. And I said, I can't do that and also be on Wall Street raising money for more house. There was something of an internal crisis. I mean, Cheryl and I, we had to pray through this. And I said, I have to be honest with my chair about what I feel called to do. Of the president, what, what do you mean? You're president of more house, this is me. I, I know it is. But I've got something else operating here that I've got to be true to. And now I'm at peace. And I thank you all for your prayers and support for this, uh, for this decision and this journey. What I would also say to you, young man, is you talked about balancing the call and hold the opportunity. I think you ought to look at what really gives you a feeling of accomplishment. And I used to say this to students I talked, who said they were going into medicine, and I said, when you go on, I want you to visit a doctor's office, when you spend time. If you don't get a feeling of fluency, you ought to think about something else. Don't look at the money. Don't look at the fame. Look at what gives you life, what makes you. And it ceases to be work. It becomes a joy. You all know, Dr. Bostic, you just inspired uh, Howard Thurman's wonderful quote. I've used it on a few occasions. Uh, do not ask what the world needs. Do what makes you come alive. What the world needs is people who have come alive. Good evening. My name is Paul Robinson. I am a freshman here at Morehouse, and I serve as freshman class president. The question that I want to address to anyone on the panel, um, well, first I want to make a comment that um, Congressman Hilliard, you, your words inspired me, and if other freshmen were here, I'm sure that it would inspire them because you admitted that here at Morehouse you had some trouble, and we all do some crazy things as freshmen if we're really true to ourselves. Um, and I want to get some advice from you all on the panel that, you know, because we all have some advice to give in life of the places that we've been 
and you all were here as freshmen, what would you tell freshmen, what would you say to freshmen to inspire them and to help their, um, you know, help their experience here at Morehouse and to help them achieve, achieve goals? First thing, get to know your advisor and, and, and your student advisor as well as your faculty advisor. And, and get involved. You, you need, Mohawk, when I was here, there were 600 students. I think you got about 25, 27, something between 25, 100. There will be those you will know more about and know better than others. I think you need to get what was the math club, the alphas, get with the groups, <laughs> develop friendships. And because you're going to need somebody who has a common interest that you can sit and share ideas and talk to and be able to communicate. Because at an early age, life is difficult. You will have problems. And sometimes you're someone who has a real genuine interest who can give you some guidance would be worth a million dollars. Mm -hmm. Any Kappas want to say something? <laughs> <laughs> it's, I try to look back over my life and try to see what did influence me the most. Uh, at school, at home, and I think I mentioned some of these things earlier when I was when we were talking uh, about my education. At early age, of course, my parents. My parents. I have to say, that my parents and my and my mother playing games with me. When I get in college. Uh, you're right, getting somebody who's interested in what you're doing and that you believe and have faith in what they're saying to you. When I was here, of course, they were, you know, we had a biology department and my biology teachers were very, very supportive. Very supportive. What was interesting about that, and I probably shouldn't say, is that after going to medical school and being in a medical school where we were the, truly the minorities. Uh, it became very frustrating to be in medical school at a time. I need to finish this story, which is an interesting story, and it's a true story. So when I was in medical school, although I was there working every day and going to class, it got to be very boring to me, very boring, almost like being in college again. Yeah. <laughs> so what I did, I went out to a building where I heard that there were black Afro-American physicians. I didn't know any at that particular time. My parents and family members were not physicians. And of course, I knew a lab person that had been drawing blood, some point by drawing blood with my mother. And I went out to his lab. I ran into a physician. I told a physician that uh, <laughs> that was a medical student at Emory and that uh, I was getting tired of medical school. What could I do to keep interested, make myself be, still be interested in it? And what he did, he uh, sort of adopted me. <laughs> so every day I would go to uh, do class, my class work at Emory, and then I would go back to his physician office the afternoon and see patients. So by the time I got to be a junior or senior in medical school, I mean, I've been already seeing patients with this physician. Now, the reason I mentioned this, which is very important, about this physician, this physician's name was L.C. Brown. He was really the person who had the idea to start Mohawk School of Medicine. And they actually give him credit now for, you know, for doing that. Because he did this time where they had a lot of medical association here 
but they also had the Georgia State Medical Association. So going back to what you had said earlier about having someone who's interested in what you're doing and you're interested in what they're saying to you and they're working with you. For example, he tried to pay me for coming out seeing patients. And my point was to him, how could you pay me and I need to be paying you? And uh, of course, after he beat me down, <laughs> I let him buy me some books. But the point was is that he took an interest. You know, I couldn't have gotten that anywhere else. I definitely did not have it in medical school. So my ego kept me in medical school. He kept me in medical school because he had an interest. He actually did cardiology too. And it's probably one of the reasons why I got interested in cardiology. But uh, getting to know people. When I was in medical school, we also, I'm not going to drag this out though. When I was in medical school, we also started a little group where I went around the different, and I must have been aggressive. I don't know why, but I must have been aggressive. But I went around the different uh, doctor's offices. So we started sh shifting medical students to those doctor's offices so they could get interested too and doing things. So it's working, it's working together, as he said, having somebody who's interested in you and you've been truly interested and not letting someone turn you around. Because in schools, they can do that. You get become very frustrated. As you know now, we're having problems keeping males in medical school. When we look at, we, we have a group in our Atlanta Medical Association. I'm, I'm sorry, I have to uh, It's all good. We have a group in Atlanta Medical Association that we started uh, back, back in 1995, giving scholarship money to students. We give scholarship money to students at Morehouse, Meharry, and Howard. Since 1995, we've given away a little bit over $400,000, uh, and we've given money to 130 medical students. Of course, I'm the treasurer for this group, and I look at the numbers very carefully and go back. It's really interesting. I bet you 75% of the people we're giving money to now, and nothing's wrong with this. Females. We, we don't see men. We don't see males a lot going to medical school at all. I don't know whether or not the people are just not interested in doing that, or whether or not they turn, or turn around because they know doctors don't make any money anymore. I'm just not quite sure what, what the factors are. But uh, you have to have people that are interested in you, and you can find those people. There's some of us are still interested. All right, thanks, Doc. We have uh, six more minutes. Time for one final question, short, tiny, tiny, tiny question. Absolutely. Because of the brevity of time, I understand we're pressed for time here. This question is for uh, Congressman Hilliard and Dr. McLeod. And my name is Marquez Hubley. I'm a senior finance major here. And um, it's a common trend with you guys being first, first to graduate from the cardiology program, first to uh, represent the um, state of Alabama and that right. What are some of the challenges that you guys had to overcome? Short, short uh, um, explanation, but short challenges of being first. Just you know, there's a pressure, just, just the pressures that you had to overcome uh, in being first in something, to be able to stand up and say, I'll be first. I, in a couple months, I will be 70 years old. And when I graduated, it was all, everything was surrogate. So there were so many of my classmates who ended up being the first in almost any endeavor that, uh, that, that was different from education or ministry. That was it. So with me, it was just getting into the practice of law, getting into the legislature. I was the first black senator. They never say that. And one of the reasons why, I was the first everything. Every time I went to another level, I was the first black to do this, first black to do that. Now, things are different. You have had the pioneers. So what you have to do is take from where we left off and go far. And the world is so competitive. You just got to be prepared. You got to be ready. And as Dr. Franklin would say, you got to have a moral compass. You got to know where you go. All right, Dr. Franklin. 
I was enjoying his response, and I didn't think I didn't know that you were asking me to reflect on this since I was as for Dr. McLaurin. Dr. Yes. Dr. McLaurin. Dr. McLaurin. Yes, I follow. Dr. McLaurin. Quick. Big bite. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what am I do? At what question I answer in directory? Uh, just the adversity and challenges that uh, came first. about by being the first to finish it. It can be difficult. It's interesting that uh, I was talking to the young man who's going to be presenting me this evening, and a point I made to him, if you make up your mind you want to do something, you don't let anybody turn you away from doing that. Because your friend, I, I think I told you, when I was uh, in high school, I was talking about being a physician. I was talking about being a physician, and. Uh, my uh, friends say, well, you know, we're going to be making money driving big cars while you're still be do not doing anything. Your friends are turning away. Yeah. Sure, I don't like to tell. I was in my ninth grade class. My ninth grade class, and uh, the teacher went around the room. This Afro-American teacher went around the room saying, what are you going to do when you grow up? And I told her what I was going to do. I told her to be president of a company. Uh, she didn't laugh at me verbally, but laughed at me basically and said, uh, well, if you were not born into money and your parents did not own a company, you would not be president of a company. I said, okay, fine. I'll be a doctor then, or a lawyer. Well, people will try to turn you around, and they don't know that. They're not doing, doing it on purpose a lot of time. They're trying to keep you in reality. But the point is, if you make a decision, you go for that. Diversity, I know it's a problem and with respect to how other people are going to treat you if you are the only Afro-American there. It can be difficult in some cases, but I was from here, I'm from Atlanta. So if I got frustrated across town, I just got in my car and went, went home or came back and left home on Atlanta, <laughs> side of town, the west side of town. So you have to fix your, or make your own world and it can become very frustrating. But the goal was, I decided eighth or ninth grade I was gonna to go to medical school and no one was gonna stop me. No one was gonna stop me. A lot of some of my friends did get stopped. So it has to be your commitment, your commitment. As I said before, and I, I'm crazy about my little motto that I came up with when I was actually players in a fraternity when they asked me what your, your ideas about life, and I'm not going to name it fraternity. But that's what I came to this idea of. No task is too hard to conquer. No goal is too hard to achieve. To be is to be. I, I, and I will be there. I'm not going anywhere. You can't train me around. Thank you, thank you, Dr. McLaurin. He's coming out with a CD in June. You can pick it up. Can I just say the reason I'm the oldest up here? He said he's the oldest, okay? Yeah. Quick, quick, Dr. McLaurin. I will. I was the first coordinator of foreign language course, C, for the state of Georgia in 1960 to 66, if you remember what was happening at that time. And I'm the only African American who ever has held that position. And believe me, it took all that I learned at Morehouse and some more to face the racism, the prejudice that I faced going over the 100 59 counties of the state of Georgia. But we've succeeded in developing one of the strongest language programs in the nation, and we were the first to develop a television program in Spanish in the nation. So it can be done. Right, it can be done. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for showing up this afternoon.